Hi everyone, I am Chirag Thakkar, Commissioning Editor at Roli Books, and this is Roli Pulse brought to you by Roli Books. Welcome to our specially curated series, Publishing Perspectives, where we bring together our peers from the publishing ecosystem to facilitate exchange and cross pollination of ideas. Remember, you can check out all our previous sessions on our YouTube channel, Roli Books, which, if you haven't yet subscribed to, please go do so now. Also, follow Roli on Instagram, on Facebook, and Twitter. And if you want us to put out more such content, then please show us your love. Type in your comments in the comment section below and share this with your colleagues, your peers, your friends, anyone you wish to. This is the 10th episode of Publishing Perspectives. And today's conversation is on changing book marketing strategies. And I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers for today, Amish Tripathi, Anand Padmanabhan, and Kapil Kapoor. Amish is an author, columnist, and diplomat. His books have sold over millions of copies world over and been translated to 19 Indian and international languages. He's also director at the Nehru Center in London. Anand Padmanabhan is CEO at HarperCollins India. He has previously been at Penguin Random House for about 18 years and has also worked at a bookstore in Chennai in the 90s. Amish and Anand are going to be in conversation with Kapil Kapoor. Kapil is director at Roli Books and founding director of CMYK, India's first dedicated bookstore of art, illustrated and design books. So welcome to Roli Pulse, all of you. Kapil, why don't you get us started? Thank you. Thank you, Chirag. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Amish. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Roli Pulse, a digital initiative of Roli Books. So today, it's a pleasure to have uh, both of you on this episode of Publishing Perspectives. Thank you for taking part, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion, as I am sure all the viewers are as well. So in today's episode, we want to discuss the importance and evolving nature of the marketing function in a publishing house and how authors play such a significant role in this. I'll just start by saying that as a publisher myself, I have been witness to how drastically this has changed in the last 10, 15 years. And when I say this, I mean the whole marketing um, ecosystem. You know, I remember a time, um, Anand and Amish, there was a time when authors and publishers did very little consumer-facing marketing, apart from the odd book launch and a signing session. Uh, but most activities that we did uh, centered around trade marketing, you know, things we could do inside bookstores, point of sales, posters, and so on. Now, it's safe to say that that world has completely um, gone you know, e-commerce and social media has changed this completely. And today we all do so much more consumer facing marketing for our books. So over the next 40, 45 minutes, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this and it will be great to hear both of your thoughts um, as uh, um, industry leaders, both from, an, you know, Amish uh, from an author point of view and Anant uh, from, from a publishing point of view. Um, I think, Young, young authors, young marketeers, young publishing professionals would uh, learn a lot from the insights that you share. So uh, let me quickly start with um, Amish. Amish, um, your first book was published 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And this week you've released your eighth book. Right. So all your books have gone on to become massive bestsellers. Now, my question is, can you tell us how the marketing strategy for your first book 10 years ago differs from the one today, how has it evolved over the years, and what in your experience has been the most effective tool? Uh, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the things in the, uh, in the publishing trade, because it was a, it has become a little bigger now, it was a relatively very small trade. Uh, the entire publishing industry put together is less than the sales of one big bazaar store, where that, uh, tiny. Uh, so as a result of that, our scale uh, in terms of marketing, in terms of distribution, has challenges. Right? Uh, and uh, so therefore, you know, we obviously couldn't imagine things which are out of the box. We simply didn't have the scale, we didn't have the budgets. Uh, and it's a bit of a chicken and the egg that you, if you want to grow the market, you need to invest. Uh, but you don't have the money to invest. Uh, so therefore, you remain small. So, uh, a part of it was also, frankly, uh, errors in uh, in the way we uh, the way the publishing side approached books. We were frankly creating book books only for a very tiny segment. Latin Delhi, South Mumbai, 
some parts of Alipur, Calcutta, Chennai. Frankly, no one else was interested in the industry. Kind of subjects, the way we presented things, obviously. You know, so, then the scale was very tiny. This started changing slowly over the last 10, 15 years. Which brings me then to how uh, marketing has an impact. Because remember, marketing is not something, and I'm not speaking as an author, I'm speaking as a corporate guy. Uh, marketing is not a, a, a discipline that exists by itself. It is not uh, an area where marketers go to have fun, you know, at wine and cheese events. That's not the purpose. Marketing has to serve the overall business strategy. It's not an Indian itself. Right? So first, what is the overall business strategy? So if there is a book, if it appeals only to say a very tiny, any size elite segment, few events at five stars, get it sponsored ideally, and then that's it. It's done. But if you want to hit uh, numbers of a few lakhs, of a few millions, then you need to appeal to the real India. So then, A, the distribution has to be in place for that. Make sure that is in place. Uh, there are capacity constraints in our, uh, you know, in our distribution network itself. Fortunately, online has come and expanded uh, that. Because mm-hmm. We don't have that many bookstores. Anand will reconfirm that for a country of our size. We have very few bookstores. Uh, and it's not that Indians don't read. I, I disagree with that. And we, are, uh, we are the only surviving Bronze Age culture. Every other Bronze Age culture has been wiped out. We are the only culture which keeps stories which are six, seven thousand years old, which which are heard till today, right? Which are mm-hmm. celebrated till today. Sri Rudram was there in the Vedas seven thousand years ago. Shaivites like me chanted till today. Uh, no, Purushukta was there in the Vedas. Vaishnavas chanted till today. So it's not that we are not attached to our stories. Mm-hmm. It's just that the kind of books that we used to come up with earlier had nothing to do with the real India. So obviously they weren't interested. Now if we do, then there is a market. So you need to figure out how to distribute and then marketing needs to add on to that. Right? So uh, it's a part of an overall strategy. It's not just about posters and that's not good enough. You have to know what is your, like for example, right now we've launched this book, Suhail Dev, in a pandemic, uh, uh, unprecedented lockdown situation. right? And it's a call that, uh, uh, you know, that, that we debated and, you know, my attitude has always been think positive and, uh, you know, aim for the boundaries, right? Don't, uh, don't be defensive. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I find so many publishers just postponing books, right? Uh, there are some industries which are doing that, which I think is a mistake. Right? A year later, you may lose half the players in your industry Then you're your capacity itself becomes lower, then you're stuck at that for the next 20 years. So, right? mm-hmm. uh, you know, to use a Mumbai term, thoda daring karke, you mm-hmm. need to figure out, okay, now and this is the constraint that I have. How do I distribute and what marketing will play a role in this? If you get this entire background, then you understand what, was, what role was marketing playing for me in 2010. I'd been rejected by every publisher. They weren't interested in this book. It's a Hindu book, you know, religious subject. Who'll read it? Long book, you know. They said that uh, the bestsellers are not more than 100, 150 pages. My books are long, 400, 500 pages. Uh, I was also told by a publisher at that time that you have these gyan sessions every two, three chapters, you know, philosophical discussions with the youth aren't interested in. You know, you want to appeal to the youth, you have to dumb it down a bit. Which one realizes is not true. They are. They're actually insulting our audience by assuming that we have to dumb it down. You have to make the language simple. Right. Right. You don't need to dumb it down. It's not that you can't quote from the Upanishads. It's not true. So so what I'm... If I'm... Sorry, go ahead. What marketing adds into this? That is the... You have to be clear on all this and then get into marketing. Mm -hmm. What I find the mistake that is often made is people just jump straight into marketing. Where actually, it's a bit like Pura war strategy kuch nahi tayar hai. You know what I mean? So unless the entire strategy is clear, then the marketing strategy that you must have will emerge logically. That this is the business problem. So therefore we should do this, 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 this. There's no standard marketing strategy. Right. So if I if I'm understanding correctly, uh, and Anant, I'll, I'll ask you to jump in here. Is Amish is saying that you know first and foremost we need to understand who we're publishing for, what that universe is, and then somehow 
the next steps uh, come logically. Uh, so why don't you jump in here and uh, first, you know, give us your experience and respond to Amish here. Oh, th thank you for having me. And it's great to be in conversation with Amish. I, think, I don't think we've had this before. I, we won't oh, never. never at all. So it's a, it's a, it's I'm sorry, a, I kind of stay away from most parties, parties. I just, <laughs> you know me, yeah. I'm a little reserved. There are five million of your books for us to engage with you, Amish. So that's fine. But anyway, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good point. I think it's a good point we're making at this point of time, right? But I, there are two, 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 two large-scale instances that I want to mention that that uh, from a from a um, getting more books to more people fundamentally, correct? As a publisher, we want to sell more books to a lot many people. There are some books which a lot of people will buy, but there are some ideas that publishing houses will publish that only some people will buy. And those ideas are meant for a purpose. So there, there is a reason why some books are a certain print run and some books reach a lot more people. But even in 2007, uh, at that, that point, there wasn't any major online and stuff like that. There were a lot many bookstores. Uh, I think all of us would remember that. 2007, when the seventh Harry Potter published, it sold 275,000 copies in 48 hours uh, across all the shops in India. You know, there was a big embargo. Books went on sale at six in the morning. Um, and it sold at 1,295. So for something as phenomenal uh, uh, as the scope it was, for the price it was, a very large page extent hardback for children, it taught us a lot about when you have a book that everybody wants to read, all doors open. And whatever time you want to sell it, wherever you want to sell it, people will land up and buy the books. So volumes get across. Uh, Mark Manson has sold 500,000 copies of everything is fine. Now, we even had a, a scenario where some books said that uh, there is a profanity on the cover, so I won't even display it. Uh, so we had some problems around that. But effectively, to go back to your fundamental question, um, marketing simply means that you tell as many people as possible through as much medium as possible that something great has been published. And if you're a book lover or if you're a lover of stories like what Amish says, go buy this book. And these are the reasons why you should buy that. Um, he alluded to it. So the constraints of the industry, sales problems have been sorted because of online. But it is true. The, the, the job of a really efficient sales director and his team is to ensure that you can buy a book wherever you want in whatever format you want at preferably a competitive price. And as long as, as a publisher, we make sure whether it's print or e or audio or you, you know, podcast, uh, as long as the author's message and the story gets across, uh, life is great. And then that's what we've been doing building. I think it's an important point that Amish makes, which is what I was also going to bring to the table, is that you can tactically talk about what has happened to one book. Uh, but it, it is a moment in time because we have the technology now that we didn't have. You know, when I joined publishing, uh, there was no way of finding out when the new Jeffrey Archer was going to be out until a publisher came and said, here it is. And then you would wait put it on display, wait for the customer to come in on a Sunday morning to ask for it. Then you wonder, how did he find out about it? Right. Then came to a point when you collected orders on fax. Uh, so the whole idea of a print run or any number notionally was how many distributors are there and how many bookshops can I take it to? Which is why it seemed like everything was number driven. Now you don't need to do that. Um, the, the, the job is to encourage proper demand, but at the back of it is the entire strategy. Understand the category, understand how many people there potentially you can buy. Uh, do you package the book well uh, and what's in between the covers, which is fundamental. Right. So as Amish said, that distribution has become easier largely due to online. And now most publishers have that access where they can technically have every book available to, uh, to people, to readers. So the tr my question is that today when largely distribution is, well, I wouldn't say sorted, but it's easier, marketing therefore plays a larger role. Uh, much more than sales does. Earlier, we had to ensure that books and distribution was perfect and the books were available everywhere. Today, it's more important that people are able to discover and, yeah. and, and so that they can go online or they can go to their bookstore and buy that book. So specifically, how is that in today's scenario, how is that, uh, how are you achieving that? How has that changed uh, from what you were doing earlier? So we now live in a world where a tweet can make or break a book. One tweet by the right person. Maybe it's not even the right person. It just has to have the right timing and it can make, make it completely big. Right? We now are in a place where um, there are Instagram bloggers. You can make a film. There are bloggers. You can do performance poetry. Uh, you can 
make a film like we did for our 25th anniversary campaign. You can do all the traditional publicity, all of the digital publicity, but is to understand. So I, I would say we're talking about this just at the beginning of the lockdown is that unfortunately in our country has a combination of not many bookshops, over dependence on one form of selling and really not much consumer insight coming back at the publisher level. I really don't know who's walking into a shop, whether in Bombay or Madras or Bangalore, buying one of our books or one of our authors. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was convenient to hide behind the bestseller. But we don't know who and who bought these books. So there was no minimum guarantee on an author's next book selling as much. So that has had to change so we understand who our consumer is, where do they shop, what are the mediums that are most effective to get to them. There is always a fluctuating curve between what book works on Facebook or what works on LinkedIn, what works on Twitter, uh, whether we should just make a film, do we have an author in conversation. Um, I, but those are just, that's technology. Right. Uh, just because we have a mobile phone, it's not like we speak to more people than we want to. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with Netflix or Amazon. There is a lot of choice, uh, but you have to be reliant on a word of mouth. Somebody would come and tell you that money heist is great. And then you want to take out either a commercial decision of spending the money or spending the time enjoying that. So the, the owner still rests as the, the, so where do we start thinking about marketing, right? When an editor walks into the meeting and mm -hmm. says, I've got this book and it's fantastic for the voice, for the story, for the positioning, whatever. It starts there when we start thinking about, okay, who are we going to publish it for? Does it have an existing audience, which is the genre? Mm -hmm. We want to create a new audience. Take the whole girl phenomenon, right? From Gone Girl, Girl on a Train, Dragon Tattoo. So the dysfunctional girl up to the Eleanor Oliphant is Gail Honeyman's latest book a couple of years ago. It's now over 3 million copies, soon to be a movie. Why did it become huge? Despite the girl being a phenomenon for many, many years. It, plugging into all of these channels and getting women to understand and read that this is a fantastic entertainer. So you can't give up. But you carry that passion that the editor brings to the story when we come into an acquisition meeting, carrying it through every aspect of the chain and involving the author right throughout so that you can reach as many people as possible. No, good point. Good point. I think extremely uh, you know, insightful uh, point by Anand. Because, see, the thing is, what is uh, and the most powerful force to build any creative uh, endeavor, book, movie, anything, the most powerful force is word of mouth. And what social media has done is it has turbocharged word of mouth. Yeah. Correct. So what you can do with marketing is just induce trials, right? But beyond a point, like good marketing will destroy a bad book even quicker. Yeah. Uh, you can just induce trials. Uh, whether a book is genuinely good or not, only time will. Like the Sanskrit word for a for a classic is Kal Jai, that which conquers time. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyone else's opinion in the present day means nothing. Readers, critics, no one. Time is the only true judge. But in the immediate term, it is the opinions of readers, right? Which will decide whether the book will sell or not, right? And word of mouth has been turbocharged thanks to social media. And one of the things even companies have realized is that they're not in control of their brand. They're, they're not brand controls. They're like brand facilitators. They can trigger, maybe facilitate the uh, the conversations. Uh, the the downside of, of the and, and sorry, just one more point on that. That obviously then books uh, which are in tune with the zeitgeist, okay, with the mood of the times, have a greater chance of, of success. You know? uh, so there is uh, not just in India but across uh, across the world uh, as a corollary to the feminist movement has been this. Disturbed girl who's fighting the system, so to speak. Okay, the equivalent of the angry young man of Hindi movies of the 1970s. It's part of the zeitgeist. So books which are in tune with that work. Uh, part of the zeitgeist in India today is the real India rising. Right. So books which are in tune with that, you know, are in, if if they serve some purpose, they have a greater chance of success. The downside with uh, social media though, and with uh, online. Are a few. One, uh, the easiest way to to break through the noise and the clutter is controversy, which is why you find so many people consciously try and create controversy. It's one of the things I'm very clear on. It's a strict guideline to my publishers. Under no circumstances will any book of mine ever sell through controversy. 
but I can understand where some marketers say, look, it's easy. You, know? mm-hmm. you don't have to do, you don't have to work too hard, trigger some controversy, social media, TV channels, there is that energy for negativity and controversy in any case that that itself just carries the book and the movie through for the for say two weeks before the lynch mob goes on to the next uh, controversy. Uh, this is a, if you want to avoid controversy, it's harder work, but I think it's much, it's not just the right thing to do. It's better long term as well. You can't play the same uh, trick again and again, controversy, bar, 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 it's not going to So that is one issue. The other issue is the point, the, the problem with social media, with mobile phone, the distraction that's there, uh, is the attention spans. They have collapsed, okay? uh, among, especially among millennials and uh, Gen Zs. Right? Uh, I'd read this report. It was it was uh, it was based on an American survey, but I'm sure it applies to much of the free world at least. You know, Europe, US, India, Southeast Asia probably applies to all these places. The average attention span of the youth is apparently eight seconds. Uh, just to give you a perspective, a goldfish apparently has an attention span of nine seconds. Right? Uh, so they are so distracted. How do you grab their attention? And one of the things one is seeing, which is very interesting, um, is average attention span has collapsed. And what the millennials and Gen Zs are doing is either they are giving you nothing or they are giving you everything. Either they won't even give you eight seconds or they give you an entire weekend. Yeah. Uh, they will binge read three of your books or they'll right. binge, read four se- uh, binge watch four seasons one after the other. So it's like a very bizarre play out of, you know, Aristotle's hollowing out of the middle. It's you're just on two extremes and this has been triggered by the internet. Uh, you know, and internet was supposed to be this great democratizing tool. But in my mind, you know, over the, you can see the trends already in so many in movies and it's like, I mean, uh, in movies, for example, Disney through uh, in last year, through just eight movies, eight movies, okay, took uh, over 50% of the global box office through just eight movies. Mm-hmm. That's it. Correct. Uh, most of them Avengers series, of course. Right? Uh, it's happening in books, you know. Two authors will take away everything. A few others will take away a large number. There's very little left for others. It's happening in music. So it's very bizarre. There is a long tail. People who sell nothing will sell. On average, everyone will sell 100 units at least. But the average joke, the guy who would sell 4,000, 5,000, which used to make a business sustainable, has all moved on to just the blockbusters. Because the millennials and Gen Zs, either they give you nothing or they give you everything. There is no middle ground. There is no average. Interesting, interesting. This is a challenge for, uh, you know, for uh, publishers because if you're dependent, say, on one or two authors, Bhagwan na kare, that author gets hit by a bus. What do you do? <laughs> right? your, your, your entire business model is on, it, it makes it very challenging. Right, right. right. Uh, you know, uh, so this is. It, it happens yeah. to creative people. Sometimes the creative juice runs out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, yeah. Happens, yeah. Then what do you do? Right. right. If you're. Right. The, if your business model is highly concentrated, but the market itself is moving in that direction. Right. So this is very interesting. At this stage, I'm just going to move on the conversation a little bit. We have a, you know, a very successful author and a very successful publisher in conversation speaking about marketing. And we have a lot of young authors probably listening to us at this moment. So I want to ask Amish, um, you know, you have a very uh, well-oiled machinery, which is helping you with your marketing, the overall strategy. And it's doing a phenomenal job, as we can see. Um, At what stage in your last 10 years did you decide to have this marketing support? Um, And what would your advice be to a young author today who probably can't um, uh, put together such a a machinery? Or should they already be starting to think of that? And um, a related question to Anant after that is how do you see authors uh, playing a role in marketing in general. Uh, do you see that as um, uh, a collaborative role in a publishing house or do you feel that it's the publisher's job to do the marketing and the authors can uh, assist in that? So I'll let uh, Amish answer that question first and then Anant, if you can join in. 
since this is for authors and not for publishers i'll not answer as an uh, as a corporate guy i'll, I'll answer as an author right if, look if your aim is to make money or find fame there are much easier routes <laughs> uh writing is about the voice of your soul and there's i mean pick up a banking job or a tech job there's no dishonor in that you make damn good money it's not a dishonorable job you're not some smuggler or something writing at its core has to be it's like the voice of your soul it has to be pure uh you have to build the organization around it because you've realized that you are dedicating your life to it so therefore build an organization so that you can spend more time doing what an author should do which is reading and writing mm-hmm. i read at least 5 6 books per month i've been reading at that pace for decades uh, there is no way i can keep up this reading habit if i was managing all my uh, business myself as well i have to build up an organization i have my own marketing team i have my own uh, organization i have my own office in, in uh, god's grace the books all enough that i can build this which means that i can focus on the things that matter to me i would be much much more closely in what i am a control freak uh, i harass my uh, uh, my publisher you know to the, to the end of his uh, of the limits of his patience but i guess he tolerates it you know uh, for whatever reason he's a nice guy yeah uh, gautam is a very patient man i was going to say he's a very very patient man he's i love him man i mean as long as you know i i, I genuinely love him. Okay. so uh, Uh, but i built up my own team which manages it but the point i'm trying to make for the authors is this you get into writing because it's a voice of your soul because you want to say something right uh, you genuinely have to write you know following what lord krishna told us in bhagavad gita karmani vadikar aste ma phaleshu kadachar that do your karma forget about the fruits of your karma they don't matter right uh, and if it works great then build up that organization if it doesn't work no problem write for yourself on your weekends only your family will read it no problem but it's the voice of your soul you must write that even today when i write uh, like why have i taken up this book uh, legend of suhail dev because uh, uh, i am uh, i'm an extremely patriotic man uh, i never hide it i'm not ashamed of it i i stand up if i hear the the national anthem anywhere even if i'm alone uh but uh, you know i am a patriotic in the traditional indian way which is deeply inclusive which means uh, every uh, every indian is uh, you know is, is one of us and for me this story i in suhail dev never lose a chance at marketing legend of suhail dev uh is uh, essentially what a story of unity right uh it's a story of a leader who fights back brutal foreign invaders a uh, thousand years ago brings together an army of hindus of all castes indian muslims both this fights them defeats them kills the invaders to the last man brings us 150 years of peace it is such an inspiring story and it appeals deeply to me right and which is why i wrote it now uh, you know someone could uh, you know if there was a if there was a strategy meeting before deciding this book i would have been told yaar your name is made already in you know in uh, in mythological fiction or you know the stories of our god why are you getting into this you know your uh, uh, a, a strategy plan would have probably told me the hell with this don't do this mm-hmm. right but that's not the way i decide uh, i will write what appeals to me then we have to figure out how to make money from it right but i will write what appeals to me and that is the advice to all authors i have a story idea in mind it's come to me in london i have too many story ideas that's my problem that's why i started mm-hmm. a writer center i can't die before i finish my story ideas but i have a story idea that's come to me that is based on time travel and gaming right and because i like it so much i am ex- actually exploring gaming right i am exploring that world it's a completely bizarre different world i'm enjoying it and someone if someone does a you know strategy plan they can say what to kya kar raha hai what is this gaming you know time travel what does it have to do with your uh, it's not that i'll stop my core books i want to take this up as well that should be how a creative guy should make his decisions this is a different field from banking tech it is not a field for you know logical strategy plan bana ke you'll decide what to write it doesn't work that way whatever appeals to your heart start with that bring your mind in when you have to figure out okay how do i market how do i sell this thing so come going back i think i think uh, in a word in a word as it were i think the thing that we would like we would tell an author is the writing has to be compulsive it has to be a 
story uh, that is in fiction or non fiction whichever you write write compulsive don't write too hard uh, but there are various categories various genres um, a, a very good cookbook does not need the rigor of a very good narrative non fiction does not need the rigor of a mythological fiction of amish's category and so on uh, but an author is very important because he is the one who originated is the originator of the idea uh, there is a reason why he or she wrote it they might have written it by themselves they might have been commissioned to write the story but the author's voice is very crucial so like i said it's going back it's when the idea first comes into the room from that point onwards it is important to understand uh, what the author's vision on the book is and then we string our story around that primary idea there is a reason why it is being published who's the audience how do we reach them how can we work with the author to tell the story better so not all our authors live in the same city not all author authors live in the same country there are authors who were not able to come to india at all to promote the book but we know that uh, readers actually fall in love with the book they read with the words that their author has strung together uh, and it starts from there uh, and they have a relationship with the reader and the author and that's why even in this period in this lockdown period why all of us including your yourselves Uh, who fantastically are putting together so many conversations is that the reader can actually connect to the author right. so the role at that point as a publisher is to be uh, on the ball smart use technology and make these two connections which is also the connection that a literature festival aims to achieve right right this is not just about writers getting on a stage which is just you know one way of looking at it the the the, the true purpose of a really good festival is that readers who have engaged with their author's work who loved an author's work can actually meet their idols as well and mm-hmm. their icons that they follow you know when i was 17 i went to a jatro tal show in chennai i mean there's no i was no i was not going to fly abroad at all here is a man i think we paid 4000 bucks a ticket i wasn't even earning at that point of time but why did you go because you want to see the man whose music you're so much in love with uh, and there are authors now they ground of sudha murthy one of the country's highest selling children's writers they are not on social media mm-hmm. they don't tweet insta story they don't do any of that stuff uh, you know they don't give any gyan nothing they just write very good books mm-hmm. and then it becomes the publisher's responsibility to carry that story and i think anybody can see it and i was saying that uh, i recently read a book uh, of one of the many is that books that succeed uh, because an author is able to put that reader with a 360 camera in the middle of that story so one one way in which it does it of course raguram rajan i do what i do i sold 100000 copies he doesn't do that he just telling you what's wrong with the financial system but even there he is able to tell it in a particular way so the authenticity of that voice is very important the compulsive nature of the voice is very important and to have the author not just uh, when the first page came in but all the way through the life of the book right and it goes beyond right publishing uh topical nature of a subject we all see that backlist titles so this week uh i was looking at the bestseller charts and i was very pleased you know, slightly proud about the readership in india because to kill a mockingbird started selling a lot more which means there is an audience here which despite all the noise on social media about black lives matter actually thought knew that there is a book and they wanted to understand it and contextualize it so there are people right. here who care about that so it's important then that author might not be available but you have the book uh, and then you carry that message through through the life of the book as long as it's in print right so very important so all 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 authors uh, listening to this you have two of the best people in the industry just giving you direct advice amish saying write passionately don't worry about anything else it's the voice of your soul and anand telling you that right from the beginning be involved in the publishing process and uh, the publishers will help you get the message across so this is fantastic advice uh, guys uh, amish coming to you now and you just uh, showed us your new book um, from what we what we I see show it again yeah show it again this is great marketing no such thing as too much marketing no not, not at, at all. all so so from what we know of amish and all all the books that you've published there is a big build up we always get to find out the book is coming and we are everybody is looking uh, forward to it eagerly waiting this one just kind of came so um was this strategic um or was it because of the situation is it um yet another uh innovative way of getting attention 
Um, so I'll ask you that question and then I'll end with asking Anant, um, what are some of the modern techniques or the new ways, something innovative that you can tell our viewers about? So I'll start with Amish on surprising us with this book. You know, uh, partially driven by uh, the pandemic situation, you know, the, getting the books available. In fact, we were thinking the book was supposed to be launched a few months earlier, but then because of the pandemic, it got postponed. And like I said, uh, we don't want to delay it uh, beyond the point. I'll, because I'll, I'll have more books coming. And I genuinely believe that in a scenario like this, it's not in the industry's interest to stop all launches. And we have to... For all you know, we may never go back to the old normal. Right? We can't keep waiting for things to return. Uh, so many retailers are shutting down. Some distributors might shut down. Boss, the industry is We lose muscle. We'll not just lose fat. We lose muscle. The industry may not have the capacity to sell those numbers a year later if we don't pump in some sales and some numbers now. Uh, and if the industry's capacity comes down, the top sellers also get hit. Uh, uh, so uh, it is in the selfish interest, I think, of even the uh, people, uh, the, the writers who can sell well, to make sure that we we find some way to sell, find a new model. So that is one aspect. Mm -hmm. The other aspect uh, was actually at a you know we had uh, discussed this earlier as well. You know there are various forms of you know there's a build-up marketing, uh, you know which was how my books used to normally be, you know and. We had even had an event once to announce the name of my book, which had got a lot of coverage. I had led to a spike in sales of my previous book. So we announced the name of the book. Then we launched the cover of the book. Then we launched the trailer of the book. Then we started pre-booking. And at all these, you know, we'd get you know, some of my Bollywood friends or cricketer friends. That, right. Uh, it would spread over uh, three months. Now... This, yes, it creates hype, it builds up hype, builds up good uh, pre-order sales or around day one to push out a huge number, which is good. Uh, but I, you know, I remember I, the good thing with social media is you get feedback as well. I, I never really engage with trolls. I only put my tweet and I just stay away. It's one of the ways I stay out of controversy. Uh, but uh, some, it's not just uh, trolling, it's feedback as well. You know, there was some of my real hardcore readers at much of this build up marketing phase would say was enough already of the marketing just give us the book <laughs> yeah. because they would get irritated beyond the point so there is another technique called drop marketing okay, which uh, you know, music albums use mm -hmm. uh, and it's normally used where you know uh, there is expectation from something from that musician or, you know, so it's not that any build up has to happen you know the and in drop marketing, what you do, no build up, nothing. You just announce it and you drop it. Okay. So sales are on from that day onwards. Right? Uh, and all efforts, push, expenditure happens after that. Uh, we thought this is as good a time as any to, to try this. Sure. And because ultimately, look, uh, even marketing is an expenditure. Uh, you know, if we can get greater throughput through drop marketing rather than build up marketing, build up marketing, remember, is expensive, right? Uh, so no matter how big the book, uh, how big the book, the budgets can only stretch that far. Uh, so, uh, so this was an idea which we thought we'll try. Uh, it's been only four days, but uh, you know, the daily sales is actually at the level of Ravan uh, of uh, Legend of Suhail Dev. So at least Maybe. at this point of time, the strategy seems to be working. Right. And remember, this is in a pandemic, right? Uh, where uh, many bookstores are still shut. So therefore, online stores are making a much greater, uh, are, are getting a greater market share. But I'm sure it's a matter of time before bookstores, at least in the south, some cities, the bookstores have opened up. You know, Anand would, uh, would know better. But uh, Chennai, Bangalore, you know, uh, uh, Ajabad, many of those, you know, the, the bookstores are open. So throughput and sales is happening from there. So that was the idea. Essentially, drop marketing. What this hasn't normally been tried outside the music uh, industry. I don't mm -hmm. think it's been tried in movies or books or anything. And so uh, we thought we'll try it. And at least at this point of time, it seems to be working. It's selling at the same daily. I'm talking about secondary sales, uh, not primary sales. Right. Sales to customers. Right. right? Uh, which we get from online numbers. It's selling at the same pace as Ravan. 
Interesting, interesting. So drop marketing. Anand, so what, kind of what happened with Raghuram Rajan's I do what I do. Nobody knew about it. On the 3rd of September, they woke up to a Times of India and Hindustan Times story where both papers carried interviews with Dr. Rajan. Mm -hmm. It's been exactly one year uh, from the time he had uh, uh, left the RBI, gone back to Chicago. Um, and at that point, the news was that 99% of the return notes were also legitimate, right? So it kind of came together. Nobody knew there was a book coming. So we had the books in the stores on the Sunday. Uh, Monday, it went on sale. Sunday, everybody knew that Dr. Rajan has written a book. But it's a very effective, and I, I, more important than that, I think it is important. So it is important for big writers who have an influence on the readership mm -hmm. to publish continuously. And I think it is so important that we don't take our eyes off it. What we have is an unfortunate, extraordinary health, economic, and operational. But the economic and economic is a uh, is a aftermath of mm -hmm. the health condition. But operational is, I think, necessity. I think it is important to stay alive uh, for what is a 90 days in the larger scheme of things. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, right? In in the in a US and UK markets, actually, books are selling a lot more at this time. Because the people are realizing I'm not going to be sitting in front of a screen right. uh, watching something, which is something that we have to be very conscious about. Like I Amish mean, is saying, the industry might shrink, but we should ensure that the overall demand for a story and the readership doesn't stop. Right. The value of the book becomes even more important in times like these when you can entertain yourself, catch up on reading, teach yourself new things uh, through books. And at the end, anyway, you will turn to books. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't published the Wuhan diary or a few other books that will come out as a consequence, even simple things about how to build your immunity, now is the time to read a book on how you can uh, work around your anxiety because of the uncertainty that the world is throwing at you. You need books to tell you. You need authors who have researched or authors who have the imagination to tell you this is the way you and keep your mind active, not just the body, right? Uh, but there's a lot of innovation. I think technology should be leveraged fully. We've gone from publishing full books through all of the processes that Amish is talking about to Ravinder co-writing a short story every Friday at midnight. Um, we, and you must have noticed this. We launched eBooks right through. We mm -hmm. said print can come, mm -hmm. but we were publishing eBooks right from March, April, May. The, through this time, we've had books go out on sale. Authors have been extremely supportive to say, I understand the point that books have to go out. Uh, you know, Shankar Iyer wrote a Gated Republic or Arvind Panagriya wrote a book called India Unlimited. Now is the time to read books like that. You, you can't wait six months later when the world is going to change and look different. We need mm -hmm. to keep that going. Um, innovation is key. So I think we have to just use every format, reach readers through either it's an audio book or an e-book, uh, different forms. But more than the word book, I think eventually we are not talking about storytelling. It's very mm -hmm. key to keep doing things where you're able to reach more and more people um, and do stuff. But the one thing that, and this is part of the industry and the point that Amish also has referred to many times, we've never had enough bookshops. What is going to happen or might happen largely over the next few months or a year at least, is that the ability of a bookstore for you to spend half an hour looking through the shelves, you might pick up a book because of the color mm -hmm. of the cover. And design is very important, as you know, you would agree. Uh, or you might pick it up because you heard about it. Or a physical book might trigger a memory about a review you read. We don't have that advantage anymore. Mm -hmm. People will be reluctant to go into physical shops. They will go to online when they know they want a mission. They go to buy something or test something that they haven't heard of, unlikely. I think it is important now for the industry to think about how can we replicate uh, the bookstore experience. High quality websites, more information, more look inside more community building, more genre-based marketing, more mm -hmm. encouraging book clubs because now people are at home. People are not going to be able to go on their foreign holiday for a while. They're not going to be able to go to the mall on the weekend. Uh, so they not only have disposable income or discretionary spends available, but also they have time. Uh, and I think we should think about ways in which we are able to give more people more information about the authors we publish in the category. And readers are like chain smokers, right? They will read. Uh, but also it's a time now with, you know, Amish or any other bestseller that we publish is to bring in new people to watch a film by all means. So do we, but read. You will not be able to appreciate the story if you're not a good reader. I think we should all read a lot more. Amazing. You know, so Anand has said something so insightful and this is 
he understands the industry well he's been here for for so long and this is a critical thing which i think the industry does not appreciate enough i don't have an answer for it but the the browsing experience that comes in a bookstore that is so critical and the, the online is simply it's not designed like that not it's not just for books for anything online is not designed on your phone you can't browse right? mm-hmm. you can only go to what you want buy it and leave there is there has to be some solution you know and this pandemic will hurt bookstores even more and at an overall level if the browsing experience dies out we will lose readers and that is bad for the industry long term that is a it's a critical strategic uh, issue very insightful point by anand so i don't know what the answer is yeah uh, we have to yeah. find some way it is critical for the entire industry we have to find some method to aid browsing where you discover a book that you haven't even heard of by chance that's the only way the industry will keep expanding it's like that is disclosure so a bookstore i don't know what an answer is no so maybe we create virtual bookstores use technology hopefully, hopefully, and do yeah. virtual walk ins you know bookstores yeah, just yeah, send yeah. truckloads of photographs of their store but mm-hmm. there won't be new books we'll have to create a way to think about it yeah. but ask people to just do a virtual walk through yeah. uh, you know like in korea i read a few years ago you don't actually have a uh, grocery or department stores there's no big box you touch a screen right you just keep touching what you want it's a walk through but they don't stock things and then it gets packed at the back end and we have to think of ways in which we can do yeah. that so i'm i'm a little conscious of time uh, but we could go on uh, forever we've got two of the best minds like i said uh, speaking on uh, you know books and marketing uh, but uh, thank you thank you both uh, for for joining us today i think there is a lot of food for thought a um, lot of uh, encouragement a lot of uh, optimism uh, authors uh, you know continue to write to feed the system uh, publishers jobs to um, you know innovate uh, keep marketing books keep uh, making sure that discoverability um, as we just uh, alluded to uh, is 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 kept alive so thank you thank you both for being part of this uh, latest discussion on publishing perspectives on roly pulse uh, for all of you watching uh, please follow us on facebook twitter instagram for updates and more exciting activities from roly pulse stay well and keep reading keep buying books and believe in books thank you all thank you thank you, thank you.